expectations these four days and a warm welcome to all of you to the final day of FTP. Let's make it even more productive. And now I'm going to introduce our today's speaker, Dr. Mukesh Dobley, and he's here with us to deliver a talk on proteomics tools. Dr. Mukesh Dobley is a professor in the Department of Biotechnology at IIT Madras. He has previously worked for 23 years in Imperial Chemical Industries and General Electric Technology Centers. His areas of interest are biomaterials, drug design, bioreactors, and bioremediation. He holds B.Tech and M.Tech degrees in Chemical Engineering from IIT Madras and a Ph.D. from the University of Aston, UK and has postdoctoral experience from the University of Cambridge, UK. He has authored 320 technical papers, 10 books and filed 12 patents including two in USA. He is a director of two startup companies in biotechnology. He is a fellow of Royal Society of Chemistry, London and recipient of Hadelia Award for Excellence in Basic Research from Indian Institute of Chemical Engineers and the Doe Professor M.M. M. Sharma Distinguished Visiting Professorship in Chemical Engineering at Institute of Chemical Technology. He has received the 5th National Award for Technology Innovation in Field of Petrochemicals and downstream plastic processing industry, Government of India for the innovation in antimicrobial food wrap. He is in the editorial board of the journal Chemical Engineering and Phytomedicine and a member of the American and Indian Institute of Chemical Engineers. Apart from that, he is an active and inspirational personality with immense passion towards research. We are extremely happy to have him with us today. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Mukesh Doble to give his talk. Sir, please. Thank you very Time much. notice for all the audience. Uh, the feedback link will be provided in the chat box at the end of the session. Thank you. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Thanks for the kind introduction. Let me thank uh, Professor Kripanandi Sar and uh, Professor Venkateshwarlu uh, for inviting me to give a talk at the FDP. Uh, I'm pleased to be here and talking to you. I'm going to talk about uh, proteomics tools. So uh, there are several tools which has uh, really propelled uh, proteomics to a higher level. Um, so the tools and the proteomics research went hand in hand. And uh, that is why there is a lot of development in uh, proteomics. So we will cover some of those. And we'll also look at uh, what are the problems in uh, understanding proteomics, what are the problems in getting the, the, the sequence and structure of a protein. Uh, so you all know about this, uh, you have the DNA and the mRNA, then we have the uh, protein, so genomics, and then later on comes the proteomics. So there is a lot of research originally on genomics, looking at the genes, um, and then came proteomics. But the complication about proteins are um, the same gene could produce uh, many proteins and the same gene at different uh, situations, uh, different stress conditions can produce different modifications in the proteins at different uh, amounts or levels. So trying to understand this concept is way much more difficult in proteomics when compared to genomics. Um, so as I said, uh, the proteins could be um, expressed at different times, at different stress levels, at different locations in a cell, um, at different amounts. So we, the idea is to understand this and, and trying to un get the structure of these proteins and then try to um, get the sequence of uh, these proteins. Okay, so the uh, proteomics uh, is a post-genomic area. After the genomics came proteomics, it's much more complex than genomics because proteins are expressed at different levels different times, different forms. So if you look at uh, different organisms like yeast or C. elegans, human and so on, uh, the number of genes could be only this much, but if you look at the number of uh, proteins per cell of a yeast, it's almost a million. Uh, if you look at human, uh, the number of genes could be about uh, 35,000 max, maximum. We don't know the function of many of them, but um, the number of proteins are almost, uh, see, four lakh proteins. So the numbers are huge. Um, so that's the complex of uh, proteomics. Okay. Um, so if you look at the timeline, as I said, 
as the instrumentation for proteomics developed, the research in proteomics also went hand in hand. So um, if you look at um, 2D gel electrophoresis, which happened uh, later of 1990, a mass spec, which came much later, okay? And then we have the LCMS, then chip-based assay, and then we have the various algorithms because uh, proteomics or getting the sequence of the proteins uh, is not just instrumentation, but a lot of software, uh, algorithms and analysis go hand in hand. I will show you some of them, but not many of them. Uh, so the time frame went as the proteomics research uh, really took off. Same happened with the instruments, the mass spec, the LCMS, chip-based approach, and so on, actually. So there is a convergence of different technologies and resources into proteomics. Uh, so what's the goal of proteomics? Identification of each protein, of course. Levels of protein expression, okay? Um, so how much is the amount of protein? But the interesting thing is they do not always correlate with mRNA levels. There are situations where the mRNA may be less, uh, but the, uh, the protein may be more and vice versa. We want to do a lot of post-translation modifications. So that gives you an idea of about the types of protein, sites of protein. We want to understand interaction between protein-protein interaction. That means um, how one protein interacts with other protein, leading to some diseases. Now, there is a lot of interest, um, not only inhibiting proteins, but also inhibiting protein-protein interaction. For example, um, there is a protein called CMIC and that interacts with uh, another uh, protein called prostaglandin E synthase, which is involved in inflammation. So can I try to inhibit this protein-protein interaction? Okay, so that's uh, another strategy in drug design. Um, so in addition to the normal inhibiting a protein action or an enzyme action, we can also try to inhibit a protein-protein interaction. Um, then molecular machines. Protein localization. So where is it localized? Is it in organelle? Is it in the cell? Or is it in, and so on, actually. Then what's its function? In normal state, stress stage, and disease stage. So normally, protein may be in some form. When it gets stressed, it may change its certain forms. When the quantities may change. And when it is in disease state, it may be in totally in a different form. So can we use them as markers to identify a disease, or can we use them as markers for, say, presence or absence of uh, certain functions? Okay, so that way prote proteomics plays a very important role in medical um, biotechnology, especially medical diagnostics. Okay, another problem is with protein, the sequence is very, very important. You all know amino acids, it's 20 amino acids. So different combinations of uh, the these amino acids can lead to different sequences and the proteins can have totally different functions. So that's very, very important. If you look at say, allylene, serial and phenylene. So the this order is not the same as the order in the other way actually. Okay, so um, you cannot say that because uh, the amino acids are present, protein will always have the same function. So the order of the amino acids is very, very important. So conventionally, we have the N terminal, that is the N is the nitrogen that's present in the amide, then the C, that's the carbon that's present in the amide. So that will be on the right-hand side, the N terminal will be left-hand side inside actually. So there are many theoretical possibilities for these sequence of amino acids actually. So if you take a tripeptide, okay, uh, tri means three. So if you take 20, 20, 20, there are 8,000 possibilities. So if you take a 50 of them, then it could be even 20 raised to the power 50, actually, because 20 amino acids, 50. So we can have theoretically proteins uh, with so many sequences, 20 raised to the power 50 sequences. Okay, but interestingly, evolution has selected only about uh, 1 million, okay, different sequences, but not uh, this 20 raised to the power 50. 20 raised to the power 50 could be billions, but ev evolutionary, there is only uh, 1 million sequences have been selected. So that's a different story. Why only those? We don't know. So that's the complexity of protein. Unlike your genomics, um, you can have sequence uh, differences. You can have different combinations of these amino acids, which could lead to different types of uh, protein and so on, actually. Okay, different types means when I say functions and actions and so on. Actually. So the goals of proteomics, identification of each protein, 
levels of protein expression, how much? Post-translational modification, we will spend some time later. Protein-protein interactions, uh, protein function in normal, stressed, disease states, protein localization. So that's the goal of your proteomics. And so proteins have shape and function. Okay, you all must have studied in your biochemistry. Uh, there is a primary structures. Okay, that's the sequence of amino acids. That's easy to get with the um, MS, MS and so on. Uh, then secondary structures. Okay, we need to crystallize the protein, go into X-ray crystallography and get uh, whether helices, sheet, turns, loops, tertiary structures, three-dimensional arrangement of helices, sheets and turns. Okay. Because three-dimensional structure is very, very important uh, for its uh, performance. Okay, structures called as structural protein, proteomics. Protein folding. Some proteins don't fold properly, um, so that could lead into certain complications. Some proteins get unfolded, that leads into some other complication. So the protein folding, again, is a very important area uh, to understand. So uh, with proteomics, we have to consider all these aspects, especially the primary structure, uh, which is sequence of amino acids. Then we have the secondary structure, like helices or sheets or turns or loops. Then you have the 3D structures. Okay, you can also have 4D structures where uh, we are talking about uh, the uh, uh, di tri and tetra um, and so on actually okay because some of the um, proteins for example lipoxygenase or cyclooxygenase they may be in a dimeric form okay so the proteins have shape okay three dimensional shape that leads that leads to functions um, so the active site may be in some parts which is not accept accessible and so on actually okay so if you want to know about the act action of the protein function of the protein, we need to get the three-dimensional structure. So if you want to know the three-dimensional structure, we have to use, uh, X, we have to crystallize the protein, and uh, then we use X-ray diffractometer and get the st crystal structure, and then um, that helps you to develop the 3D structure. There is a database called a protein data bank, PDB, which contains a lot of uh, 3D structures of uh, protein. Uh, if you are interested in uh, primary structure sequence, there is another data bank called Unipro, which gives you sequences of uh, um, thousands and thousands of uh, proteins. So interestingly, uh, you, the primary structures of many proteins are known, but the 3D structures of uh, only some proteins are known. That's because uh, you have to crystallize these protein to get the 3D structure. And um, so that's a very time consuming and very tricky process actually. So if you go to Unipro database, you will get millions of uh, um, sequence of proteins. But if you go to PDB database, you will get only uh, much less, much, much less 3D structures. If you go into medic uh, medical area, proteomics uh, plays a very important role. Um, identification of the protein in the body, their role in such activities as transmitting diseases, uh, identifying protein structure, interactions, pathway. So if I know the pathway, which leads to certain disease and we know which enzymes or proteins are um, playing a role. We could, um, that could be your target, which could be inhibited by designing a drug. So you can use it as a disease marker. So we know certain proteins are overexpressed or underexpressed during certain conditions. Um, so we can use them as markers. Drug targets, some of them, like I said, uh, could be inhibited. So that particular pathway could be inhibited the way the progression of a disease could be stopped. For example, uh, cyclooxygenase 2 is an enzyme uh, which is involved in inflammation. It's called arachidonic acid pathway. So if I inhibit cyclooxygenase 2, I may stop inflammation. There is another enzyme called lipooxygenase 5, um, which is involved in asthma. So if I inhibit the lipooxygenase 5, I may uh, prevent the progression of asthma. So uh, they are very good drug targets okay they can be used as disease markers okay. uh, they can be used for diagnosis so a lot of things can cellular mechanisms so uh, by looking at uh, protein expressions we can understand mechanisms potential leading to new cures for human disease increased understanding of cellular process okay so all these are uh, possible and uh, it's become very important in the area of medical so there are uh, thousands of companies which are working in proteomics. It's become a very, very important. So there are thousands. Um, the value of market 
is almost 18 billion US dollars uh, in 2015, and it's expected to grow at a percentage of 15%. That's a very important actually, okay? So proteomics um, combined with bioinformatics, protein biochip technologies, that means uh, you can have a chip containing uh, thousands of uh, proteins involved in thousands of disease. So I could take a, a molecule, possible candidate, and um, put, uh, put, put a sample on each one of these wells and then see which uh, protein gets inhibited. So I will know maybe that particular uh, drug uh, candidate could be uh, a good drug for that particular disease. So there are a lot of interest in this uh, biochip where we have proteins uh, immobilized on thousands of wells. So a lot of tools are uh, become very important in proteomics. Mass spectrometer, MS. Much I heard about MS. Um, combinations of MS, MS, MS. Then we have the MALD, CELD, quadruple traps, uh, time of flight, okay. Then we have EAST2 hybrid system, 2D gel electrophoresis, okay. Uh, then we have the software tools. A lot of software tools are being used, um, which helps uh, to understand the peaks that are coming out from the mass spec MS, MS, and trying to say possible um, amino acids and trying to get the sequences. So text mining, all these are databases, softwares and servers. Then we have protein chips, protein arrays, like I said, in medical biotechnology, it could be very useful. We could have a, a chip with thousands of proteins immobilized and we could, um, we could scan one particular drug molecule against all these proteins and see which protein gets inhibited. Um, again, computational tools. All these tools are helping you to um, understand the mass spec data. And then also based on the amino acid sequence, you may be able to get a phylogenetic profile and say this, uh, this particular protein is closest to this particular uh, um, protein and so on. So, Many, many tools are there. Then we also have surface plasma and resonance uh, spectroscopy. So all these proteomic tools um, are very important to understand, characterize yeah, a new unknown um, protein. So challenges of analyzing protein. Uh, protein can be a very small one or it could be a very, very large one. Okay. Uh, that's the challenge. So I should be able to um, systematically uh, able to get the sequence of a very small protein or very, very large. Uh, relative abundance, okay, it could be very, very little uh, copies per cell, it could be a huge amount. Okay, uh, diversity in human cells, so it could be very diverse, okay, almost going to one lakh. It could be in different forms, so when we modify with post translation modifications, we could get different types of. Uh, modifications. And now um, in genomics, we have uh, the PCR, qPCR, which can help you to amplify the amount of g uh, genome, okay, uh, DNA, cDNA, and uh, able to see what genes are there. But unfortunately, um, such a tool is uh, still not present, where um, very small amount of protein could be amplified, amplified sufficiently large um, to um, get a sequence of that. So there are no such tools available. So that's a big challenge, unlike uh, PCR, which is available for uh, genomes. So we use a 2D gel, okay, most popular. Um, then we affinity purification, 1D gel electrophoresis, organocellular purification. We have the HPLC. Uh, high pressure liquid chromatography, then capillary electrophoresis, microfluidic devices. So uh, these are used for separating the protein because if we are getting, um, taking a mixture of protein from a diseased patient from part, and uh, there could be thousands of proteins um, before sending them into the mass spec, we need to separate them into various components. So uh, there are many tools um, which are used analytical tool which are used uh, for separation. We'll talk about a little bit uh, as we go along, okay? Uh, one dimensional, this has been there much uh, earlier, much, much earlier for separating protein. So proteins dissolved in bu buffer, protein gets charged to uh, proportional to its molecular weight. Um, so when you apply a voltage, 
uh, they travel up um, they travel at certain velocity and depending upon the molecular weight and the charge that has, it has acquired so high molecular weight proteins remain at the bottom uh, low molecular weight um, travels faster or those which have a uh, higher number of charges travel faster so this this is the standard thing um, which we have done um, much longer so that's called the one dimensional but in a two dimensional uh, we have uh, two things we resolve based on um, isoelectric point isoelectric point as you know uh, is the ph at which the charge becomes zero so um, we separate them based on isoelectric ph and we separate them based on its molecular weight so we get protein spots um, like this and like the previous one where uh, it's in a one dimensional based on molecular weight here it gets spread out so we have when you run a 2d uh, we will get uh, the the various uh, components of various proteins like this so one may pick up one particular spot uh, take it to the lcms or lcms ms to separate that each spot could be um, hundreds of protein that's the most uh, challenge in uh, 2d uh, each spot could be hundreds of proteins so we need to separate them okay and um, so we may have to do a lot of optimization so that uh, if you have very big spots to further uh, make it into finer uh, spots so in a 2d uh, we get proteins based uh, on their isoelectric ph as well as based on their molecular weight separated out uh, on a 2d frame uh, then we have the preparative isoelectric photo. That is the first part of it. High performance liquid chromatography, anion cation exchange chromatography, for example, the, uh, based on the charges, we could separate proteins. Okay, if it is more cationic or more anionic. Uh, how do the proteins get charged? Because we have the amide bond there. So nitrogen in the amide can take uh, N plus and the carbon uh, can, the carbon C double bond O. o can get a negative so depending upon the ph the charge um, could be the, the surface charge could be positive or negative so we could separate them based on the, that aspect size exclusion chromatography based on the sizes of the protein um, so smaller protein will uh, come slower larger protein will come faster then we have the affinity chromatography we can have affinity ligands as uh, on the uh, stationary phase. So the proteins which bind to the affinity ligands um, will come out slowly or will get trapped. Those who, which do not bind will come out fast. Then we have the hydrophobic interaction chromatography. So based on the hydrophobic um, surface, the proteins which are more hydrophobic will remain inside longer. Though those which are hydrophilic will travel faster okay so um, you can separate out proteins based on different uh, principles of chromatography or we can use the isoelectric focusing that means based on its uh, uh, the ph um, okay so 2d electrophoresis first dimension is isoelectric okay then we have the sds page that's the molecular weight part of it um, then we visualize using uh, staining Different types of stains are available to stain uh, these spots, okay? So, as I said, uh, each spot could be hundreds of proteins. So, a bigger spot could be even having having 1,000 and 2,000 protein. So, not all spots are different proteins, okay? Uh, many spots contain more than one protein, okay? That's a big challenge in that. Um, so... We can use silver stain gels to stain the protein, but then um, we, the silver will contaminate if you want pure uh, protein coming out. So that's a problem. So there are many problems. Reproducibility. If I repeat uh, the 2D gel electrophoresis, I will not get the same uh, pattern as I got it. Uh, incompatibility of some proteins with the isoelectric focusing. So the first uh, uh, the dimension where we use uh, isoelectric focusing there are abandoned proteins can be seen that means proteins which are found more can be seen less abundant cannot be seen that's a big problem so if you take yeast two-thirds of its 6,000 genes proteins related to that can be seen so about 30 percent of proteins 
cannot be seen. And if you use a silver staining, maybe you will be able to see only thousand proteins. Sometimes proteins overlap, four to five proteins resolution. That's the best we may get. We will not be able to get one single protein as a spot in the 2D frame. So these are the problems with, uh, with the 2D um, SDS page. Okay, so a little bit of uh, biochemistry. Okay, so um, as you know, uh, this is the peptide bond. We have the C double bond O N. Okay, we call this the peptide bond. Uh, this is the peptide bonds, peptide bonds. Okay, uh, the C terminal, as I in initially mentioned, you must have studied in your biochemistry also. N terminal is on the left hand side. C terminal is generally taken as on the uh, right hand side. Okay. Generally, the peptide bonds are the weakest. Um, so in a mass spectrometer, the peptide bonds breaks. So if you have a long um, okay, protein, um, so the peptide bonds will break one after another and after another. So you will get uh, mass corresponding to these uh, fragments. So that's how we try to identify the uh, amino acid sequence. So the peptide bonds are the easiest to break. And of course, there are uh, even uh, I may later on sometimes uh, even the uh, amine bonds also can break. That is a CN bond, but uh, generally the peptide bonds break easily actually. Okay, how does this peptide bond forms? So we have the um, acid and we have the amine. So they still join together and uh, we get the peptide bond here. Okay, then we have um, uh, 20 amino acids. And these are the mass values up to two uh, decimal places. Um, this is very important because sometimes uh, uh, two amino acid mass value can be equivalent to um, another amino acid. So that complication comes in. I will show you the example later. So uh, it is not that it's very, very unique. Sometimes two amino acids, uh, um, mass value will be equivalent to another amino acid. So we won't know whether it is uh, two amino acids or one unique amino acid. So that problem will come later. Okay, then you have the post-translational modification. Okay, uh, and this is very, very important, post-translational modification. So we um, add this uh, particular, this is the very common phosphorylation. Okay, this is the PTM post translation but there are many, many types of PTMs possible, okay? So I will show you in the next slide. Um, so, so it attaches a phosphorylation, phosphoryl group here, okay? Why it is doing that? It helps in the fragmentation in the mass spec much better. We will talk about that later. So phosphorylation is a very common post-translation modification. Uh, if you go to this uh, particular uh, um, uh, database, it gives you 183 types of PTMs. Okay, so there are a large number of PTMs possible actually. Um, there are many types of post-translation and modification. Like I said, um, there are many, many types of uh, post-translation modifications that are possible here, as you can see here. But uh, the, for mass spectrometric studies, we generally use the phosphorylation here. Okay, uh, let's spend some time a little bit on the mass spectrometer because uh, MS, MS, MALDI, MS, MALDI, TOF, uh, ESI, MS, they all play a very important role uh, in getting the sequence of the um, proteins. So a typical mass spec, uh, we have an ionization. So there are different types of ionization. We can use electron ionization. That means we bombard the sample with the electrons. Um, so the sample um, gets ionized, okay? Sample gets breaks down and then uh, it gets ionized. So the problem with the electron ionization is uh, there are too many fragments and you get too many peaks in your uh, mass spectrometer chromatogram. So that's a big problem actually. You can also use fast atom bombardment. That means instead of electron, we can use uh, slightly bigger atoms. So they will have less energy. So the fragmentation um, pattern is much more reasonable. That means there are not so many fragments. 
that is happening. Then you can have laser desorption. That's the MALDI. Uh, so the laser light is helping uh, to uh, excite the sample. We can have electrospray. That means you at high voltage, you spray the sample. The sample acquires a certain charge. Okay. Um, this is a very good uh, system because uh, the fragmentation does not happen. So it's easy for you to understand uh, uh, the, uh, the sequence much better. So there are four different types of uh, ionization possible, the electron ionization, fast atom bombardment, laser, desorption, and electrospray. So initially, uh, we have to separate after 2D, we take a spot and then we put it inside a GC column or HPLC. GC we use if it's uh, um, low molecular weight. So generally for proteomics, we don't use a GC system. Um, it's mostly used for uh, phytochemical small molecules. So we will use um, uh, LC, the HPLC column, okay? Uh, or it could be just the sample itself without a column. Then we have the ionization taking place electron, fast atom, laser, electrospray, um, and then the charged um, particles gets filtered or analyzed. So different types of techniques, quadrupole, magnetic, time of flight, ion trap. Um, so some of them are uh, captured, some of them are allowed to go. And then here we have the electron multiplier um, where you and uh, see what is the molecular weight. Sometimes you take those samples and again bombard it, uh, you get again another fragmentation pattern. So you could have a MS, MS. Sometimes you have MS, MS, MS. So uh, large fragments are further broken down uh, to get the sequence and then the bigger fragments in those uh, fragments are again broken down. So you get a fine um, set of fragments and try to understand the sequence of this. So you can have a MS, 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 and so on. So typically, uh, you may get this type of uh, okay mass spectrum here. Okay, So 280, um, here you get uh, okay 282 as the largest peak. Okay, here, this is the uh, long chain, uh, okay, amide here, C double bond two. And then these are the various uh, fragments that's happening. Generally, uh, like I said, amide bond breaks, so you can get a fragment. Sometimes double bond breaks, um, so you will get fragments. So based on the fragmentation pattern, and if you know uh, approximately what type of molecule, you'll be able to uh, try to get the structure of the molecule, actually. Okay, so electron spray ionization. Like I said, um, here, uh, high voltage, and the sample with the solvent is sprayed out, very high voltage. So the sample acquires a charge. And um, so there is not fragments taking place, unlike uh, electron bombardment or uh, uh, atom bombardment. The sample itself is flowing nicely uh, with charge. It could take a plus one, um, two plus, three plus, and so on. Okay, Then it goes into the mass spectrometer here. So this is a very mild uh, technique. So the fragments are not formed. So it's very good for uh, protein or um, peptides and so on. Whereas uh, for small molecules or phytochemicals, we can go for simple um, electron bombardment technique. But for proteins, like it's good to go for ESI or MALDI type of techniques, which are much milder. Um, so that you don't get too many fragments and then the mass spectrum becomes very complicated and becomes very difficult for you to identify what are the various uh, amino acid sequence. Okay, so um, so you are sending the sample in, okay, um, high charge and then uh, the solvent gets evaporated, okay, and then um, finally the sample goes into the mass analyzer. That's the technique. So the solvent gets removed. Uh, you are applying almost uh, 4,000 volts. So the sample uh, gets highly charged. So like I said, it can acquire uh, one positive charge, two, three, four, and so on, actually. So a typical ESI, you may get such uh, nice uh, okay, spectrum okay, corresponding to each one of them. Okay. Uh, one problem with the ESI is the same um, 
sample can acquire many charges. Okay, so it could take one charge, it could take two charges, three plus, four plus, five plus. So when we look at the m by z, we may get confused. Um, so if it is one charge, okay, so we may if it is a ten thousand uh, molecular weight, so one charge ten thousand one. Okay, uh, if it takes a two charge ten thousand two, it becomes actually so. Uh, we may consider think that it's a uh, 5001 molecular weight and so on so if it is three charge we, it will become 10003 and um, so it, we may think it's a 3000 3000 you may get a peak there so um, uh, if it is one charge say 10000 molecular weight will show a peak at uh, m by z of 10000 if it has acquired a Two charges, two positive charges, it may be seen at 5,000. Uh, if it has acquired three charges, it may be seen as 3,334. If it has acquired four charges, it may be seen as 2,500. So if you get peaks like this, then you will know the same um, uh, peptide has acquired plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four, plus five charges actually. Okay. So that is one problem with ESI. First, we need to resolve this problem of um, same uh, peptide acquiring multiple charges surface most, mostly they are they are surface charge if you look at maldi maldi is matrix assisted laser desorption ionization technique so there is a matrix so your sample is kept on a matrix and the laser light is uh, shown um, is focused on the matrix not on the sample so the laser uh, this uh, the matrix gets uh, excited and then in turn um, excites your sample and then uh, gives it a charge okay so the laser light does not directly fall on the sample so very sensitive samples um, it doesn't break it into fragments um, so only the matrix uh, tries to excite the sample so there are different types of matrix matrices available depending upon the sample type you are using because matrix um, material also should not uh, uh, will anyway come in the mass spectrum and that should not confuse uh, your, uh, um, your sample mass spectrum. So we have to select a matrix material whose mass value does not fall in that range of your sample. But it's a very good technique because it's very, very mild. Actually. And like this. So you get very beautiful, as you can see here, um, peaks corresponding to mass of each uh, of the um, material present inside. Okay. Um, so there could be two different approaches. You could have a linear versus reflection. So um, this is called a time of flight. So depending upon how long it takes to reach the target, the mass is determined. So a small um, molecular weight uh, sample will reach the target faster. A large molecular weight uh, sample will take much longer time. So depending upon the time it reaches, the mass of that particular um, fragment is determined. So sometimes you have a linear type of design, as you can see here, okay? Or you could have a reflected mode, okay? It, this is this reflected mode gives a better accuracy because the traveling time is much larger. So depending upon the mass, uh, the time it takes to reach uh, your uh, target or your detector uh, is more. So based on the time it reaches the detector, uh, one decides, uh, one says that the mass is proportional to that option. So that's called time of flight. Uh, that's a type of detector. Uh, so there are many advantages, disadvantages of MALDI. There are many advantages, disadvantages of the electron spray. Because any system, if, uh, if it has many advantages, it will also have disadvantages. So if you look at um, MALDI, uh, so it can go up to very large mass. Uh, it's got lower, a little bit lower resolution. It's a soft ionization, okay? So uh, if you want to really um, break fuel, it becomes difficult. And um, if you have salts present in this uh, in the sample mixture, then still MALDI can work. Where will you get salts? Uh, when I am uh, recovering a protein, I may do something called the salting out. The biochemistry students may know that. So we add salts to salt out uh, proteins. So some salt may be present in your final uh, solution. So MALDI-TOF can really work for that. Okay. Uh, the 
disadvantage is the matrix background like i said uh, the matrix also um, will show a peak in your spectrum so that should not interfere with your product possibility of photo degradation because you are using a laser light there could be a photo degradation of the sample so that is uh, one problem uh, advantages of electron spray so it can go up to almost uh, 70000 sensitivity is very good much better than um, maldi um, soft ionization so very bio large biological molecules could be handled very easily without expecting too much degradation it's adaptable okay uh, no matrix interference and um, multiple charging is a problem actually okay then uh, low low salt toleration tolerance so if i have salt um, this is not a good method to use Okay, so it's difficult to clean. Uh, low tolerance for mixtures. So if you have many um, components, then uh, that's a problem. Multiple charging is a problem. So if you have too many uh, charge that's taking place on the same protein, like I said, you may get M by Z the peak of uh, um, 10,000, 5,000, 3,000, 130, 2,500, and so on, depending upon whether it's acquired charge or single charge, double charge, triple charge, four charge, respectively. Actually, so that's a uh, problem we need to um, resolve or identify. Um, like I said, this is the time of flight where we can have direct mode or reflectance mode. Actually, then we have the quadrupole mass spectrum. So here we have uh, four rods here. So we have. Um, uh, RF frequency, so that helps the uh, charge um, molecules and uh, get focused into the detector. So if one is planning to collect molecules with M by Z of 100, uh, the radio frequencies of these four rods quadruple um, is adjusted so that those which are smaller or larger get trapped. So the quadruple system is used to focus the desired uh, uh, M by Z values actually. So this is a comparative multi-TOF, Q-TOF, ion trap, okay, and so on. Sensitivity, multi-TOF is very, very good. Ion trap is also good. Accuracy, uh, sequencing, ion trap is good. Multi is not very really good. Uh, selective ion monitoring, ion trap is good. Um, throughput, that means if I want to sample many, many um, samples, uh, it's very high with multi. Ease of operation, again, multi is easy. Uh, so cost, uh, this gives you an approximate cost number, actually. Okay. So depending upon the requirement, one chooses uh, the instrument, uh, the uh, throughput, the sensitivity, and the presence of impurities, uh, inorganic material, and so on, actually. Uh, so typical problems that can happen, no MS sig signals, why? insufficient sample or when poor digestion, okay, poor extraction, because like I said, if we are looking at a uh, protein mixture from a diseased patient, you may not get enough samples or after taking the sample, you may be extracting it, you may be salt precipitating, then you may be using uh, a membrane KDA filter uh, to filter. Um, so all these biochemical operations, you are missing out. Con presence of contaminants, Okay, SDS, acrylamide, all these we use in our 1D, 2D gel salts, in salt precipitation, detergents, PEG, all these are contaminants which may affect your MS signals. Contaminants of proteins itself, keratinins, peptides from trypsin cell digestion, bacterial proteins, if there are any bacterial present in your sample, that could itself could be. Um, false positive due to noise and mass ambiguity. Okay, like uh, I said, uh, in uh, ESI, you may get different peaks based on uh, how much charge it acquires. So that's a mass ambiguity. Uh, noise, there could be a lot of noise. So we may have to repeat uh, some of these uh, analysis many times uh, to see whether they are consistent, whether false positives are coming. So these are typical problems in our MS uh, uh, analytical work okay um so many of this which i talked about 2d maldi ms 
to the MSMS. So it's very good for ma peptide mass fingerprinting. So uh, if I am not interested in sequencing, but I am looking at only certain peptides, known molecular weight, uh, MALDI MS is very good. But if I want to do real sequence, I, it's a new protein, I want to get the amino acid sequence, then MALDI is not a good technique. I may go for MSMS because I want to fragment uh, these, uh, these uh, ions, go based on the fragmentation pattern, I would like to uh, get the sequence. We can go for multidimensional, okay, LC plus MSMS, okay. Uh, then we can even go for 1D gel followed by LC, MSMS. So these uh, MSMS techniques are very good if you know, one is interested in sequencing part of it. Whereas just peptide fingerprinting, if you are interested, then MALDI is good enough actually. Okay, so typical, um, uh, the 2D gel, you take a spot and then we do a trypsin digestion and then go to MSMS. And this is typically how you will get uh, the, the various mass spectrums. And then we go to some web server software uh, tools and then try to identify what the possible um, proteins are in this uh, sample taken from the 2D gel. This is the uh, flow chart of the activities. So protein, protein are isolated from gel or HPLC, tryptin digest, then sent to an ionizer, they get doubly charged, okay. Um, then they are fragmented, broken down through collision induced decay and the resulting singly charged ions are analyzed, okay. Okay, so uh, the doubly charged ions go into the colli colliding uh, chamber, collision chambers as it is called, and then they break into single charged and then those are going into your uh, analyzer. So when we have collision induced decay, we end up with two to three kilodalton. So it's very reliable for MSMS study. Okay. Uh, why do we use trypsin cleaves the C-terminal side of the arginine and lysine by putting the basic residues at the C-terminal? So that way we can understand the peptide fragment. We will look at how the peptides are going to fragment in the next slides. Uh, why doubly charged? Uh, when I take a doubly charged and then I fragment it, you end up with a singly charged and it's very easily, easily to um, get it analyzed in the analyzer of the MSMS. Okay. Uh, let's look at a little bit of the peptide, peptide fragments. Like I said, uh, the C double bond O, okay, C double bond O N. This is the peptide bonds here. So if you take a short um, peptide, so we have here one bond, here one bond, and so on. Uh, so when we break uh, the peptide bond, we get two types of ions. One is called the dot daughter ion. The other one is called uh, okay B ions and Y ions. So we will look at that in more detail. Okay, B ions and I ions. So if you take a typical um, okay, peptide like this, and uh, if there is a break in the bond here, uh, this portion will be seen in the mass pair. Uh, this is called the Y ion on the right hand side. And the portion which is on the left hand side, that's called the B ion. So uh, when I break the peptide here, I'll get a small B ion and a very large Y ion. And then when this breaks again here, I'm going to get a slightly larger B ion and I'm going to get a slightly smaller Y ion. Okay, so when I'm going to um, break uh, the peptide bond here, now I'm going to get a larger B ion and a much smaller Y ion. So I'm going to get three different Bs and uh, y ions actually. Okay, I'm going to get three different y. So we call it B1, B2, B n minus one, and then we are going to call uh, okay similar y ion. So we end up with so we end up with uh, in the signal B1, B2, B3, and then we will get uh, y1. Y2, Y3. So when we add B1, um, if okay, when we add B1 plus uh, the largest Y ion, and then when we add the next B2 and the second largest Y ion, so that 
some numbers, the total should be the same, okay, all the time. So that is one way of uh, rationalizing the various signals which we get. Do you understand? So um, suppose this peptide bond is broken. The left hand side is called the B ion. You will get a peak signal, and the whole larger one, okay, that's the largest one, uh, say Y five. And then when the next peptide is broken, you will get left hand side B2 ion and slightly smaller, we'll get the Y4 and so on. So when we add up B1 with Y5, when we add up B2 with Y4, the all number should be the same, B3 plus uh, Y3, okay? B4, Y4, and then B5, Y1. So that should be the number should be the same and that should be the mass value of that particular peptide fragment. So that is one way of uh, um, rationalizing the results which we get. Okay. So that will give us an idea of the sequence. Okay. So based on the B1 value, B2 value, B3 value, B4 and B5, we'll be able to build up the sequence of the particular peptide. Okay, so if you have, uh, for example, like this, allylene, glycine, stearine, and so on, actually, and then imagine uh, these uh, peptide bonds get broken. Okay, so for allylene, you'll get a B1 ion, and the next, when the next peptide bond breaks, allylene, glycine, you'll get uh, equivalent to that molecular rate B2, and then histidine, allylene, glycine, histidine together, uh, and that will come out to be the B3. And similarly, on the right hand side, Tyrosine, when it breaks, that molecular weight will be the Y1, okay? And then these two together, the peptide breaks, you'll get here. And these three together, um, you will get Y3 and so on. So um, we know the amino acid um, molecular weight and looking at um, how the B1, B2, B3 are coming out in the molecular weight, we will be able to get the sequence of uh, this particular peptide based on these Bs and Ys. Okay, so typically that's how it is. As you can see here, this is the mass spec of, um, of uh, bovine serum albumin. Okay, uh, by looking at the mass of the major peaks, we should slowly try to rationalize, assuming that the peptide bond breaks and whenever each peptide bond breaks from the left hand side, we'll get a B1 and uh, Y largest Y N plus N and so on actually. Okay, this is a mass spectrum of fibrinogen. Okay, so as you can see, um, we can uh, get the sequence based on the large uh, peaks that are found in the spectrum. Um, so yes, we make use of uh, this uh, particular uh, table where we know the mass of all the amino acids up to the fifth decimal. And that's how software also tries to uh, rationalize and get the amino acid sequence of a given peptide. But then, um, okay, there are many softwares, algorithms, Sequest, Mascot, then manual methods are there. And then once we get the sequence, we go to software called BLAST and then see whether the protein sequence makes sense, whether it compares with the known proteins um, and so on actually. So many things are there. Uh, we will not go into those aspects actually. We can also get a synthetic MSMX spectrum. So uh, if I imagine I have a peptide with uh, um, say five amino acids. Um, so I start from the left, I break one peptide. I know the molecular weight. So I expect a B1, Y5 peaks. Then I break the second peptide. Then I will know B2, Y4 peak. Okay. Then I break the third peptide. Then I will get B3, Y3. Then I will get B4, Y1, B5, Okay, B4, Y2, B5, Y1. So I will expect those um, those peaks in my mass spectrum of the um, pentapeptide. Okay, so I will expect uh, like this actually. Okay, so this uh, plus this will be the molecular weight of the peptide. Okay, and then uh, this plus this like that, you know, this plus this and so on actually. So I will, um, this is called a synthetic mass spectrum. So if I know what is the peptide I expect, I create a synthetic mass spectrum. And then if I know the mass spectrum of that peptide and see whether they both match. 
So if they matches reasonably well, then I can say possibly that's the peptide sequence of the unknown peptide. Okay, and that's based on the synthetic mass spectrum approach. Okay, there are many web tools here I have shown here, uh, which can help you to um, get the sequence based on the mass spectrum inputs actually. So many, uh, the first point is to understand the B and the Y. So the lowest mass visible in the spectrum is lysine or arginine, okay? And that will be your Y1. This is because trypsin cuts after a lysine or arginine. These are some rules uh, which one needs to understand, um, okay? The Y1 should be 147.113 for lysine, it could be 175.119. Okay, so try to find out. Uh, so how do you uh, add? The Y1 is calculated by adding 19.018, that is three hydrogens and one oxygen to the residue masses of lysine or arginine actually. Okay, so uh, we expect them to be the lowest. So once we start, once we identify the lowest, we can slowly build up moving towards the right actually. Uh, look to the right of Y1 and see if a prominent peak that is equal to Y1 plus AA. Okay. AA will be mass of for any of the 20 amino acids. So if you have a table of amino acids, um, you know the mass, then you add uh, with the Y1 and see is there a peak corresponding uh, to that. That will be the Y2 ion, okay? So proceed in a rightward direction, identify Y2, Y3, Y4 going right up to the return set. Then the YN series produces a reverse sequence. So from the YN, we get the uh, B1, B2, B3, and so on, actually. You understand? So you start from the left, uh, look, okay, you start from the left and see whether you have uh, lysine or arginine present because trypsin cuts after a lysine or arginine. Okay, don't forget, you may have to add one oxygen and two hydrogens water here, okay? And then once you get the Y1, you add a... Uh, um, one of those 20 amino acids and see whether there is any P corresponding to that. So if you get that, then you know that particular amino acid is the next uh, um, present, okay, next amino acid presents to that and then so on actually. That way you build up Y1 to YN and then you do the reverse from YN for all the Bs actually. So that is how you try to sequence. It's easy to do manually if you have a small peptide but if you are going to have a large uh, protein, it becomes difficult, number one. Number two, um, there is going to be impurities present, uh, some fragmentations present. So, so many things can happen. Uh, so, it's not so easy. That's why softwares are used to uh, get the sequence of proteins. Uh, another important point is, um, as you can see here, uh, glycine plus glycine, 114.043, uh, asparaginine is also 114.04. So you are in trouble. Um, so if you, we don't know whether it's glycine plus glycine or is it asparaginine. Okay, so that problem is there. Again, uh, if you take a, okay, alanine plus glycine, 128, okay, but uh, it can even be glutamine, which is also 128.05. Okay, and then lysine is also 128.095. So those problems are there actually, okay. Um, glycine plus uh, valine, 156. Uh, and then uh, you can have um, arginine, which is 156.1. So that problem is also there, um, whether it is this or whether it is that. So it's not so simple when you have peaks um, in the mass spectrum with those uh, embased value actually, okay. Uh, then you have a uh, leucine, 113.08, isoleucine is also 113.08, okay? That problem is also there. Then you have serine plus the valine, 186.01, and then uh, if you have uh, 186.079, tryptophan. So um, this problem also, you need to keep that in mind. Um, so as I said, once you have the, then 
use the remaining NSN peaks to see if you can construct a B ions. That is from the right to the left. That's how B ions is for. So both forward B ion, backward Y ion sequence should be consistent. Okay, then we can go to blast and then see whether any sequences are there of similar. Okay, uh, if it is not similar, then uh, you have to be very careful uh, because it, you are trying to look at something totally which is not reported at all in blast. Okay, and there are many advantages, provides precise sequence, specific data, it requires more handling, refinement and sample manifest. Manipulation. So we may have to repeat the sample many times. If it's a diseased sample from patient, then you might not be able to get so many samples. Uh, requires more expensive and complicated equipments, high level of expertise. Not everybody can do this to get the protein sequences. Slower, okay, so not high throughput, slower. But it's more informative than peptide mass fingerprinting. That's the point, actually. Uh, peptide mass fingerprinting just gives you the various peptides that are present, but when you do a MS MS proteomics approach, you get the real sequence of the protein. Okay, so that's very good. Uh, processing of peaks. So you have peaks like this. Okay. So what you sometimes you can say if the peaks are very small, we will take it as noise. So it depends on where you do the cutoff. So you may say, I would like to have a cutoff peaks, which are very small, like this star. Um, we will call it noise. So we will take only peaks which are higher. Um, or we repeat it many times and we see whether peaks are formed. If it is noise, it will not happen. One time it will happen, another time it will not happen. Uh, so we, you repeat it many times and we will consider these peaks to be the true peaks and uh, these could be false um, positives. So we can neglect this, but that means if you are going to repeat it many times, um, you are going, you are putting in a lot of time. Uh, you are the expenses are very high, and resource requirements are also very high. So, but uh, as you can see, uh, in one time you may get a noise as a very big peak. Next time you may get it very small. So we will be completely ignoring this. Okay, there are many software, uh, many uh, techniques available. Have to uh, to rationalize the results, decision trees, neural networks, support vector machines, all these help you to classify, okay? So we can say which, how to cut off, okay? Should I cut off so that we have less uh, false positives, but uh, we also have to have um, less of uh, false negatives also. So depending upon where you cut off, okay, as you can see where I cut off, I can have uh, more false positives, less false negatives, or I can have less false positives and more false negatives and so on. Um, so the cutoffs comes here. So depending upon where we cut off, we can have uh, more of uh, false positives or less of false positives or more of false negatives or less of false negatives actually, okay. Uh, okay, so for example, if you are looking at a serum obtained from healthy and diseased patients, so depending upon where we cut off, uh, we can have uh, sometimes healthy patients considered as uh, non-healthy and um, ill patients as considered as healthy. So both are possible depending upon where we cut off. Okay, so there are many um, neural network and decision tree models are available. We'll not go into that um, to reduce the false positives and capture the false negatives. So, if you want to catch more false negatives, um, because you would like to capture patients, then sometimes the false positives also may increase. Um, if you want to reduce the false negatives, false positives will reduce, but you will miss out some of the patients as healthy. Actually, so that problem can happen. Uh, it's exactly like what uh, um, the current pandemic. So do you want to capture more um, patients as much as possible? Then we are also going to have a lot of false positives also being captured actually. Whereas if you want to reduce the false positives, then we may miss out some real patients also. So there are many uh, approaches called a decision tree based approach, um, overfitting based approach, neural network based approach. I will not go into too much of these um, 
in our study here. So neural network is based on uh, how the brain works. So we create neural networks and try to read out uh, um, existing data so that it can predict future data based on how it has read the uh, past data. Actually. That's called a neural network based approach. Okay. So there in the neural network, we have a learning or uh, training data set, and then we have the testing data set. So in the training data set, we give certain amount of data for it to study. So it develops a model. And then whenever you get and whenever you give a new data, it tries to predict whether the patient is uh, um, ill or whether the person is healthy. Actually. Okay. So that depends upon how much data sets of training or learning you have given into. So neural network is very useful um, to understand and categorize into ill patients or healthy patients, actually. And then we can do data clustering. Okay, so um, if you know people of certain characters or certain traits, when we cluster, so we say that uh, um, other new data coming out from that will also fall into that particular cluster. You must have studied quite a lot of these cluster analysis, CIR clusters uh, in um, okay, microbiology. So if you're looking at some cytochrome, um, how do you group them into certain categories? It's called the clusters, actually. Uh, different types of clusters are possible. Again, um, it's a totally different subject for us to understand. Uh, chromatography is also a very important part of uh, the uh, protein separation. Okay, different types of chromatographies I talked about. Again, um, that's also an important concept because when we take out samples from a 2D, uh, it's going to be at least 10 to 20 proteins. So we should be able to separate them out before we send them into the mass spectrometer. Um, so it's a separation, purification, identification of compounds. Um, so we have the stationary phase, which is a solid or immobilized phase. So it could be an ionic uh, or it could be a hydrophobic surface or it could be a porous surface. And then we have the mobile phase, which could be an eluent, solvent, different types of solvent or mixture of solvents so that the proteins get separated well. Um, so you must have known about this. Uh, the solvent uh, separates the various samples various proteins like this. Ideally, we would like to have the protein separated so well, but in real life, it doesn't happen actually. Uh, there will be always overlap of uh, proteins. Um, okay, so you may have to do many uh, column separation before we get pure separations samples out actually. So depending upon uh, the physical principle, we may have different stationary phases and different mobile phases. So if you have a partition coefficient based separate, we have liquid liquid chromatography. If it's based on charge, we can have ion exchange chromatography. If it's based on the hydrophobicity of the protein, we can have hydrophobic interaction or reverse phase chromatography. If it is based on diffusion or size, we can have gel permeation or gel filtration or size exclusion chromatography. If it's based on molecular recognition, it's based on affinity chromatography. Okay, so different types of chromatographies are possible. And um, this is a typical chromatographic setup. Okay, so we have the packed column. Uh, sorry, we have the packed column here. Uh, the sample is injected here. Solvent system flows in and the separation takes place. Then we have the detector like your mass spectrometer or MS, MS and so on actually. Uh, so typically uh, we would like to have our sample separated out like this. But in real life, it doesn't happen. So when this particular sample goes into your mass spec, we may have two proteins, so two fragments. So that confusion is going to be there. So B, Y ions for protein one, B, Y ions of protein two also will be present in the mass spectrum. How am I going to um, get the sequence of um, protein one alone and protein two alone is a big challenge. So the, the separation, um, the chromatography separation plays a very important role in trying to get uh, peaks like this and not peaks like this. But in reality, this is what is going to happen. Actually. Um, like I said, uh, we have the protein sequence and functional information, the UniProt database, um, which gives the sequence of various proteins. So when you get your protein sequence or peptide sequence, you can compare it 
with this database and see where it falls. So this database has uh, millions of uh, protein sequences okay. present, actually. That's called the Uniprot database. Um, so for example, um, this is a lipoxygenase 5. Lipoxygenase 5 is involved in asthma. So we can uh, compare your protein with that particular protein sequence, actually. So the Uniprot database gives the sequence of the um, protein which you have. Uh, then we have the protein data bank. This gives you a two dimensional, uh, sorry, three dimensional structure of the protein. So if you have crystallized your protein, then uh, get the um, use uh, pro uh, crystallography okay, and get the 3D structure. We can compare with the existing protein 3D structure. Okay. So this database called the protein data bank. Uh, you will have only 100,000 proteins crystallized and get the 3D structure, whereas in the you may have millions of uh, proteins in the uniprot because it's easier to get the sequences, uh, whereas it's more difficult to get the 3D structure. So we can compare uh, the protein uh, with the uh, 3D structure of proteins which are existing in the protein data bank. So these two uh, resources are very useful, the uniprot, for uh, two-dimensional sequences and the PDB for your um, three-dimensional protein structure. Okay, okay. Uh, so again, this is a simple uh, uh, protein called the cyclooxygenase 2 enzyme. Uh, this enzyme um, is involved in your uh, inflammation, the inflammatory pathway. So there is a structure um, available already, three-dimensional structure of this protein available already inside. Okay. So uh, to conclude, goals of proteomics, um, it can be used for identification of protein, levels of protein, how much is present. Uh, post we can do post-translation modification. Um, it's very useful for protein, protein interaction. So especially in medical biotechnology, if I know the protein active side, um, protein, protein interaction, I can design more drugs uh, to prevent these type of interactions. I can prevent the act activity or the action of a particular protein, thereby I can um, stop a particular disease. Um, proteomics helps to find out the um, protein in the normal state, in the stressed state, and in the diseased state. Um, this is very, again, very useful in medical uh, uh, biotechnology. So uh, we can see which proteins get expressed where a particular type of cancer or particular type of inflammatory condition. Uh, which proteins are uh, uh, not expressed in or expressed in stressed state. Uh, protein localization, where the protein is present. Is it present intracellular, extracellular in the, as a Golgi body or is it present in the, um, and, and so on. So many tools I talked about, uh, the mass spectrometry tools, MS, MS tools, which can help you to get the sequence of a protein uh, from the B and the Y ion. MALDI is uh, uh, another tool which can get the um, peptide sequence. Uh, it's useful for peptides, but it cannot be used if I want to get the amino acid sequence. So we need to go into MSMS. MSMS, uh, we all, I showed you ESI type of MS. Then I also talked about the uh, different software tools to get the protein sequence. Um, there are many web servers are there, uh, which can help you to do it. There are many problems are there in getting the protein sequence. It's not so simple. Uh, presence of other proteins, presence of more fragments. As you know, amino acids itself, uh, uh, and there is confusing mass values. To, I mean, sometimes two amino acid mass value is equivalent to another amino acid. So that confusion is there. Uh, sometimes uh, noise also comes into your mass spectrum. Sometimes presence of impurities come into your mass spectrum. Uh, the matrix, which is present in MALDI, also comes into the mass spectrum. Okay, if the protein separation is not good in 2D or in LC, then that also may interfere. So all those issues are there. Uh, um, so those issues can lead to time, extra time, and more resource requirements. Okay. But uh, proteomics has become very, very important um, in the area of uh, medical uh, biotechnology. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for your time. Let me thank uh, Professor Venkateshwarlu and uh, Professor Kripanidhi Sir for giving me an opportunity. Thank you.
thank you so much sir thank you so much for taking your valuable time for us today that's an eye opening lecture on proteomics tools you have given us deep insights on goals of proteomics structure and function of protein protein biochip technologies 2d multitop msms chromatography and a few of the bioinformatics tools once again we want to thank you so much for your time and patience sir and now i would like to uh, handle this uh, end note to krupanidhi head of the department uh, now he'll talk to you sir interact with you thank you good morning to you all sir good morning sir na pramukh krupanidhi please sir sairam 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 sir so it is a wonderful talk that uh, all our participants across the world have explored now you have given us uh, excellent to uh, what is it called the tools description Uh, about the proteomic tools, and again, it is a very important statement that we have done in this post-genomic era. The whole of this biotechnology and chemical engineering is dominating all the proteomic tools. Again, you were telling it is propelling high because of the importance of the proteins in medicine and uh, nutraceuticals. And particularly, Sir was mentioning finer details. If a three peptides, uh, three residues, I mean, as the residues are in one sequence. if they are in the other sequence the order plays an important role order of the amino acids again n terminal c terminal so in a, in, a, in particularly with regard to the foldings misfoldings and again the unfoldings while the protein is doing not a good function so the protein is losing its function hither to we are healthy tomorrow we are not healthy it is because of the unfoldings and misfoldings that is happening in our body very well elucidated again Professor Mukesh Dubey sir well elucidated about the MSMS peptide fragmentation to obtain the sequence of peptides, particularly by giving a detailed account on Q and Y. And again, the evaluation of the in mass spectrum based upon commonality in mass alone or in combination. So that is very difficult situations. He explained how to evaluate the mass spectrum. Many many thanks sir for the insights into this project. Several of the software tools, how to evaluate. So there is a lot for us to learn more from you here after also. Thank you, Dr. Mukesh Dubey sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, as we have uh, disabled, uh, yeah, sir. There is one question from the participants end. Sure. Um, by East Hybrid Technology, can we check the PTMs? Yeah, we could do that. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, thank you so much, sir. Now you can leave the meeting. We want to close the meeting. Sure, sure. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank. Thank you, sir. Okay, sir. So now, dear participants. So now we will share the feedback link. So upon uh, filling of the feedback form, so all participants will get the E certificate. So so a five-day international online faculty development program on current perspectives in proteogenomics. so as successfully completed so it uh, started on july 28th so the talks can uh, get begin by sujan mamedi sir followed by divyashri nayeswaran and uh, arun dr arun shastri and uh, monica kannan and today's talk last talk by professor mukesh dubey sir so we thank all invited speakers for the sparing their valuable time in uh, delivering the invited talks we also thanks to our vignan university for accepting our request for connection of this uh, five day online faculty development program and uh, i also thank my then me ke chodi professor s krupani di sir and also my active organizing secretary dr abraham pile 
for being uh, head in the conduction of this uh, FDP program. And I also thank uh, Ms. Rohini Krishna. She is all the way, all five days, uh, she is uh, introducing all invited speakers and she spares uh, his uh, valuable time. So with this, uh, I'm, we are closing this uh, five day online FDP program. Thank you. Thank you all. So participants, please, uh, once again, I'm reminding you, we have said, already said the feedback link. Please fill the feedback link. This feedback link is active till evening, five o'clock today. So upon filling of the feedback form, all participants will get the e-certificate. Thank you. Thank you all. Participant may leave the meeting. Thank you.